The King's Indian is known to be one of the most complicated openings ever created. But in today's video, I'm going to make it simple by showing you how to use only the E5 pawn break. Now, the difficult part with the King's Indian is that if you're trying to play it perfectly by watching Grandmaster games, you will realize that generally they're playing it a little bit like a chameleon that's hiding in the bushes, pretty much using that uh, camouflage. And what I mean with that is they will balance their pawn break. So kind of depending on uh, what white plays, they will choose between e5, c5, or sometimes even using this idea to put pressure on the queen side. Obviously, this can look pretty intimidating when you are just getting started. So in today's video, I'm going to be walking you through five model games that I've played against intermediate players, mainly focusing on the e5 break and showing how it performs against a variety of setups by white. All right, everybody, looks like we managed to get another black game. And the opponent is playing d4, which means uh, it is a great time to play your favorite opening. Probably, I mean, if this is not your favorite opening, I don't know why would you watch this video in the first place. The King's Indian. Now, the King's Indian is a very special opening and I want you to not confuse it with the Grunfeld. Okay, because in this position, black pretty much has uh, two ways of handling things. Uh, Bishop g7. King's Indian move, different strategy, pawn to d5, that is the Grunfeld, that is not what the video is going to be about. Uh, so we're going to play King's Indian. And uh, now you will see kind of like the main idea behind the King's Indian is that uh, it's uh, kind of conceding full center to our opponent. He has the option to play uh, the move e4. Now, additionally, he can do many things. He can play knight f3, g3. e4 is aggressive. Many people prefer, let's say, playing moves like my opponent just did. Uh, so, bishop to g5, interesting system. I'm just going to castle. You could play d6 as well. But I'm going to get started with castling. Now, is he going to still go e4? Usually this is combined with simply playing e3. But when he goes queen to d2, this gives me a hint that he wants to go bishop h6 and kind of play uh, a little bit of caveman chess. I think we can call it that. Because uh, normally this is known to be more of like a positional setup, but uh, okay, he's doing it this way, I guess. I'm just gonna stick with the main move d6. Bishop h6, uh, h4. Uh, I mean, it's an idea, but it's just like too slow, I would assume. Uh, and okay, my man, Mr. Oswald, he seems to be really going for it. Is that a man? Maybe it's a girl. Uh, Apologies for that. He's very manly in this picture. So, bishop to h6. Now, I got many options. I don't really want to take this. But I don't have a nice way to kind of combine this with. Like, imagine if he had cast along already. Maybe taking with knight g4 would be a double attack. So, taking is usually doing uh, nothing but bringing his queen. So, normally, you don't take. I just considered it because it's a forcing move. Now, typical King's Indian move, which I think, by the way, we can stick with is e5. Now, a nice thing about e5 is that he's about to exchange our bishop. And not only because of this position, just in general, the main break whenever you're playing the King's Indian is going to be to play e5. But one nice thing about it is that we're placing our pawns on the dark squares while... Uh, you can feel we are about to trade dark squared bishops, uh, which is just generally going to make, uh, whoops, the light squared bishop very happy. Look at that. That is a happy bishop. Opponent's bishop. Not so much of a happy bishop because it's kind of staring into its own pawns. So already things are looking pretty juicy. Now I'm going to make a move that you guys are going to be uh, calling me a weirdo for making that. And I'm going to be going a5. What? Why would you play a5 in the opening? Are you, are you, aren't you like supposed to move pieces and that kind of thing? Well, I do want to move pieces, but uh, what you need to understand is that, well, this knight usually goes to c5. Whether you choose this or this path, eventually it's going to land on c5. But then the issue could be that white has the move pawn to b4. Kicking the knight away and then you don't have such a nice square for it. So for this reason... We play a5, really typical move for the king's Indian. We're just preparing that uh, spot for the knight. And a4 is now a positional mistake. Why? 
because pawns do not move backward. Therefore, look at these juicy squares for my knights. Okay, I told you that uh, the knight is going to c5. Allow me to take that back because after such mistake, I'm even tempted to just make it a knight party. You know, just look at this. Juicy maneuvers. We're going to bring the knight from f6 to c5. We're going to bring its brother to b4. Already there is a threat of potentially a fork. Be careful, opponent. The fork is really coming. Do not play bishop to e2. That would be a normal move, but it's plundering the fork. So I may be expecting queen c2, which allows knight b4. Super annoying. So in fact, even better would be queen d1. But isn't queen d1 kind of like a sad move to play as white? That feels like a sad move, you know, it's like uh, you're hearing uh, your friends have a, have a lot of fun with the party, but you need to call the cops on them. Uh, so he does not do that. He lets the party continue. Uh, shout out to our opponent here. But after knight b4, these knights are literally going to give him a nightmare. <laughs> uh, this gives me, uh, you know, uh, flashbacks to a video of Hans Niemann where he criticizes his opponent for uh, not resigning after losing a piece on move 10. So he said uh, he promoted uh, five knights and gave him a nightmare, something like this. That was his punishment for not resigning. I feel like maybe, you know, it's hard to recreate. Uh, the chest speaks for itself, but maybe uh, yeah, our knights are in decent shape. At least that's what I'm trying to kind of uh, emphasize with that. So. Important move, f5. Okay, I may be getting lost in the story, but f5, super important. That is how you get uh, that juicy King's Indian play. All right, this position is already good, but it is not going to win itself, you know. You need to kind of do a little bit of uh, something uh, in order to uh, get the fuel for the attack. So for the King's Indian, when you are having this pawn structure, this is like the most King's Indian-ish pawn structure ever. Like, pawns are sort of uh, blocked like that. Well, generally, white tries to attack you on the queen side, which they will never accomplish now that our knights are doing such a great job. And black usually just goes for this break. Ideally, uh, just going for a kingside attack. Well, no need for uh, the kingside attack because the opponent's king is in the middle. And he has just played the move knight a2. Now, of course, knight a2 is a little bit funny in itself because it's not doing anything. But highlighting how uh, annoying the knights really are. So, you know, there's a free pawn. I could take with a knight, keep uh, clean pawns. I could take with a pawn, try to get activity with a rook. I think ultimately this feels stronger just because the rook combined with a queen and his king in the center will really uh, hurt. So, yeah, I mean, King's Indian, when it goes out of control, it becomes really brutal. You pause the video and you try to find a winning blow that is going to genuinely force resignation in only 15 moves. Okay, you have two moves. So, knight e3, either knight would have been fine. We're going to take this way. And what's even worse is that opponent, I feel like he's about to get mated. I feel like, you know, he, he maybe that kind of game where he gets mated in the middle of the board. Uh, okay, I mean... King f1, hide your kids, okay? I know maybe a lot of you make the mistake of letting your kids watching this. Uh, make sure to close their eyes because it's going to be a bishop checkmate. So they may be, you know, too innocent uh, to witness something like this yet. So we're going to be taking only move, king to e3. And then it gets really brutal. Then it becomes like 18 plus content. So we have queen to g5, check. Only move. Oh no. That king is really... <laughs> he's trying to play like king of the hill, you know? Like uh, there's a variant of chess when king reaches uh, e4 square, it's a win. Not the case here because bishop to f5 kind of ends the game on the spot. So, kind of a cute uh, final picture. If you never played the king's Indian <laughs> and this is your first game that you watch, you're probably getting hooked. But... What I want to show you, what's in fact the key move of this game, what really made it all look so easy, um, you may not even consider that, but I'm telling you. So first, understanding your main pawn break. King's Indian, good opening, but if you don't go for the pawn break, 
it's kind of like a closed game. It's kind of hard to get good squares for your pieces. So e5, very first important step. Then when the structure gets like this, uh, you need to know where the knights go. I played a5, just going for the positional way, getting the knight uh, to c5. Now, additionally, if you really want to, a move such as knight e8, preparing f5, not really a mistake. I'll give you some points uh, for that too. But really, uh, important move there, a5. If there's a move to remember from this game as a King's Indian player, you really want to remember this idea. Then you get a knight's around and then the game becomes pretty easy. Of course, it helped that he played a4. But now notice these uh, holes that uh, are there empty for the rest of the game. Um, you know, as long as there's a hole, there's a goal. I don't know uh, what we can name this with two holes. Uh, I guess there was a double goal. Opponent just got uh, double occupied here. And, well, you saw it happening. Uh, he was pretty much standing no chance. So, with that being said, I think we can move on to the following game. All right, boys and girls, getting another black game. Opponent plays d4. This means uh, only one thing. It is time to play the King's Indian defense. Hello there. Okay. Gonna be going for the fianchero. He seems to have uh, the d4, c4, queen's gambit star. But then we see this knight f3. Is this a sign that he's gonna play fianchero? Maybe. Never mind. <laughs> Back into the main stuff. Now, castling is the king's Indian move. Additionally, you could play d5, uh, which takes you to a completely different universe. The so-called Grunfeld defense. But that is not really why you're watching this video. So we're going to castle, allowing what just happened, meaning my opponent uh, is just uh, growing a monster center. Okay, now the next move for the King's Indian is to play d6. d6 a lot of times is just kind of discouraging him from pushing e5, but more so uh, opening up your bishop. Take that with a grain of salt. You rarely want to play bishop to g4, like almost never, even though I know a lot of you guys may be in love with the idea of pinning your opponent's knight. If you're playing the King's Indian, please don't. <laughs> okay, it's just... Uh, not worth to give up the bishop pair like that. This is really, truly one of your most valuable pieces uh, in the whole opening for a number of reasons that are a little bit more sophisticated, so I'm not going to get into them here. And okay, opponent plays h3, stopping that regardless. That's kind of funny, isn't it? Now, when you are playing King's Indian, you have uh, many ways to break, okay? Like you could make a case for c5. Some people even uh, like to play this somewhat tricky way of going c6, a6, and then going b5. However, the main move for a true King's Indian player it is always going to be the e5 break. Okay? You're playing King's Indian. You need to set up the e5 push. Now, for the time being, it looks like e5 is losing a pawn. However, in the same time, it is not losing a pawn because of a nice tactic. Which honestly seems that we are just about to deliver because he has taken in a second, in a blink, just thinking, okay, this idiot blundered the pawn, I'm gonna take it. Fine, I'm gonna take. Now he has opportunity of trading queens. And there he goes. All right, and now knight takes on e5, seemingly taking my free pawn. What a bastard he's playing. Okay, now. Why did I play e5 in the first place, knowing that this could happen? Well, it turns out that in these positions, you have a very nice move to counter, which is knight takes on e4. That's it, okay? Are you waiting for a more sophisticated answer? No, that's just it. Knight e4, win back the pawn, black is fine. So, <laughs> as simple as, uh, as it is, I'm going to recapture the knight and... Thanks to this little trick, uh, we have managed to recover the pawn with an equal position, okay? Don't uh, expect me to now blow my opponent off the board uh, because it's a symmetrical and quite dull position, I have to say. If he was not blundering terribly in one move, now it is perhaps your chance to go ahead, pause the video, and uh, find the refutation. 
why is bishop f4 uh, a critical mistake and why are we getting so many wins in 10 moves in the king's indian why i don't get this people first you want to calculate concrete stuff we have a hanging knight so of course it will help a little bit to not have a hanging knight so i'm gonna get uh, rid of this problem immediately and now if you have a little bit of experience with solving puzzles, you will realize that uh, the important thing to watch out for is the fact that uh, the enemy king is on, is on the same file uh, with the knight. So we could punish that by playing rook to e8. Opponent doesn't have a way to further defend the knight. Even if he had, we could uh, yeah, terminate this uh, with f6. So, voila, there you go. Winning a free piece against a 1600 rated guy in Rapid. Uh, so these are the kind of games that you're struggling to beat. You're telling me. Okay. Fine. I know there's also going to be the kind of guys watching this video saying that... Uh, oh, I don't understand how these people play so badly against you. Against me, they play like 90 accuracy. I get that, bud. <laughs> uh -huh. You don't have the... You have the money to pay, uh, to pay your opponents to blunder in 10 moves. Don't worry, you'll get there. Uh, it's, a, it's a process. Okay, king to e3, we're just going to be taking this with a check. King to f3. Uh, what do we do when we are ahead uh, so much in material? Made the opponent. Wrong. Actually meant to say exchange pieces. I got you there for a second. So knight e2 comes with a check and we're just going to take the bishop. What next? Okay, whenever you have a rook and an open file, it's like you put it on the second. You know, it's like life gives you uh, lemons. Uh, you just make a lemonade. It's like you put your rook on the second. Very simple. Forcing resignation. Okay, key thing to remember from this game, King's Indian player, remember to break with e5. Uh, don't be fooled by the fact that e5 looks like it is losing a pawn, because ultimately it is not losing a pawn. Simply because of this very nice knight takes on e4 trick. All this trick in the King's Indian book. There you have it. Um, and with that being said, I think we can move on to the following game. All right, everybody, managed to get uh, another black game. Gonna go for knight f6 against d4. And uh, gonna be going for the good old King's Indian. Curious to see what uh, my opponent will try to do against that so far. Appears to be just uh, mainline stuff. D4, C4, Knight, C3. Okay, Bishop to G7. Just going for the King's Indian. Gonna be castling. Will he try to build up a massive center? Or will he go Fianchiaro? Will he play Bishop G5, Bishop F4 or E3? E4, obviously the main move in the position. Fianchiaro also alternative. But E4, okay, D6. This is pretty much the starting position. Um, if you're looking forward to pick up this opening, I think here is where basically the theory begins. We're going to reach this, uh, I think, most of the times. However, uh, I can't promise that you will only be playing against this. They play weird stuff quite often too. But okay, I mean, the opponent plays bishop to e2. This is the main move. The so-called Mar del Plata variation, where... Already, we have a bit of a tricky move. Because the main idea, whenever you're playing the King's Indian, the true move is e5. Okay, sure, some people like c5, playing the Benoni. That is an alternative, but I think it's nowhere nearly as good. If I'm playing King's Indian, I'm always breaking with e5. And I'm doing it immediately. This looks like just hanging a pawn at first, but uh, you probably already know the trick that after takes takes, takes takes, knight e5, there's gonna be this very cute idea of going knight takes on e4. And after knight e4, bishop e5, black is winning back the pawn with a very good position. So, okay, my opponent is castling. Very interesting stuff. So, here we have a choice. We could play knight c6 and enter the um, good old main lines. Or we could play the uh, trendy move, which is bishop to g4. 
honestly, this is kind of my favorite move uh, right now with the idea to meet uh, bishop e3 by playing, uh, I believe, uh, bishop f3 and then ed4, followed by knight c6, following a model game uh, between Wojtajek and Caruana. But if you are just getting started, I think you may really want to dive into the good old main lines just to get a feeling for how these positions are going. So I'm going to go knight c6, pretty much inviting him to play d5, where I'm going to go knight e7. Alternatively, he could play bishop e3, the Gligoric variation, where, uh, yeah, we could play knight g4. But no, here it is, d5, the main move. I'm going to go knight back. And he has a choice. So many moves here. In my opinion, the scariest is b4, the bayonet attack. Where I think I like a5. I usually play a5 there. But he has knight e1, classical variation. He has uh, knight e2, another move. And uh, okay. Here we go. The bayonet attack. I'm going to go a5. Gonna be going a5 against the bayonet. Now the main idea with a5 is that uh, we're trying to undermine their queenside immediately. But before we dive deeper into this transformation, what you need to understand is that in the King's Indian, okay, already here, after 97, the pawn structure is kind of very intuitive. By these pawns, white is gonna look forward to expand with c5, will basically dedicate all of his forces to destroy our queen side. While in the meantime, uh, black is gonna use moves such as 97, f5, and try to push pawns onto the other side of the board, and we're just going after the enemy king. All we care is usually checkmate, and in the same time, try to slow him down on the queen side, which is why uh, a5 comes in very handy. Because if you don't play a5, then he just gets very quick uh, play on the queen side. So after takes, Okay, this is one of the moves. He could also play uh, bishop a3 there. This is actually what used to be the old main line, where I think the line uh, went pawn takes and then b6. So b takes, I think it's what the computer recommends uh, nowadays, which is kind of funny. Like I used to play these variations first time, maybe like eight years ago. This move was considered not so great, <laughs> but now it's the best move nowadays. It's very... Kind of fascinating to see how the theory developed. So I'm gonna take with the rook. I think a4 they are now supposed to play, and now I'm gonna go c5. Uh, yeah, I think c5 is the move. I'm trying to recall my uh, analysis. c5, so I guess he cannot go dc, uh, knight c6, bishop a3. I mean, he can, but knight e8, I guess it's okay. Um, yeah, I think c5 should be okay here. It's just that even takes, I can perhaps take with a pawn bishop a3 and then play c5. I'm giving away d5 square, but we're gaining d4 square. So that should kind of, uh, yeah, compensate for it. So I like c5. A lot of the times uh, I think he plays bishop d2, we go rook a6. I like the rook uh, kind of covering the pawn. So yeah, just gonna do this sort of uh, preventively, not uh, having to bother about that. Uh, and next, I'm gonna go 98, I think. Another idea could be to play King H8. I guess that's another plan to play uh, Knight G8 and then Bishop H6, uh, trying to trade the Bishop. But okay, this so far this guy either uh, just cheats or really knows he's opening because I'm pretty sure this is best play for white. Uh, <laughs> There's like some kind of Hikaru game uh, that I used to study in this line. Uh, but okay, I mean, it's a bit early, but I have to say for somebody that is only 1600, the theoretical knowledge is more than impressive. Bishop d3. Looks like a strong move. I'm gonna do this uh, knight move with idea to play uh, bishop h6. Try to exchange the bad bishop. So maybe queen c1 could be interesting prophylactic idea for him not to allow uh, me to play bishop h6. Curious to see if he's gonna play that. Okay, there it is. There it is. Very strong. 
Uh, okay, can I double down on that? I don't really see a way. I guess I'm just gonna have to play 98 and then uh, I'm gonna go for the f5 push, just going for our uh, typical King's Indian play. I'm curious to see what he's gonna do though. I'm pretty sure we're gonna learn a valuable lesson about this structure pretty soon. I'm just waiting to find out what it is. Okay, queen c2 now, kind of what play. I don't understand why he would allow bishop h6, so maybe, uh, yeah, maybe it's actually him who's playing. <laughs> you never know these days. So, I do believe once we get the bishop trade, black should be okay. Because notice how we have pawns on dark squares with light squared bishop. The bishop's very happy while uh, opponent kind of having passive bishop. Notice how his uh, pawns are placed in the same color as the bishop. Now when queen d2 is getting played, I'm just wondering whether I should play king g7 or knight back. I'm more inclined towards knight back just because after f5 I can still take with a pawn. So king g7 if I want to do f5 and take with a pawn. Maybe it's not as good, like his queen could come close. So I'm just gonna do this. Notice how the king's Indian, uh, when the pawn structure is kind of uh, blocked like this, uh, it really becomes uh, a maneuvering game. So yes, king's Indian could lead to a lot of tactical interesting games. But a lot of the times it really comes down to who can maneuver better. And I think very important idea to keep in mind here is that f5 allows knight g5. That could be annoying. And if you push, he goes knight e6, forcing bishop takes, but then the enemy knight lands on d5. It feels like you could uh, win the e6 pawn easily, but uh, even if you do so, white will have great compensation. But sometimes you just have concrete issues, like here if you take it, knight c7 could be annoying fork. So I think important before you go f5, Always watch out for knight g5. Therefore, a move like h6 seems to be justified. So I'm gonna do h6, I'm gonna do f5. If opponent is uh, sleeping, I'm gonna go f4, g5. Really with a mating attack, it feels. I'm sure he's gonna try to do something different though. After f5, he's probably uh, gonna go ahead and take and try to somehow uh, justify position of the rook. That's why he, the computer likes rook a3 uh, as he played it early because the rook could be helpful in this fight against uh, black spawns. Mm, yeah, I think position so far very balanced, but uh, yeah, what can I say? Impressive stuff for a 1600 rated opponent. <laughs> Still kind of mind blowing uh, to me. I cannot move uh, this knight because the pawn would be hanging. I don't want to rush with f4. Maybe f4 is a good move. Like f4. I think uh, just feels good because intuitively queen d3 looks scary. But I have bishop f5 at the very least. Do I have even more? No, I think just bishop f5. Tempo move. He had good opening, but by uh, multiple decisions that he did, I think that's a clear indicator that uh, he's pretty confused. So I'm pretty confident that this guy is not a cheater. But I have to say, yeah, the way he started the opening was really scary. I could do bishop trade, but perhaps it's better to just play queen f6 just to kind of keep the tension. Maybe queen g6 idea. Like imagine he takes... I think uh, we just uh, take control of a valuable uh, diagonal, targeting the rook. And notice how constantly this knight is very well placed because it's stopping knight c7. Like imagine we forget about knight c7, then uh, this knight not only attacks the rook, but infiltrates to e6. Which is a very important idea that uh, we need to watch out for. And I think now simple move knight f6, preparing rook g8. Also preparing maybe e4 ideas if he's not careful. E4 could be a problem. Maybe not immediately, but you get the point. Queen e3, e4, maybe he still has queen back. And I'm pinned, but uh, that's risky for him. Another idea in such positions could be rook f7, rook g7 to maneuver, but uh, I feel like activating the knight just, uh, you know, gets you to kill two birds with one stone. So 
I'd much rather have the active knight. And notice how uh, the rook that's usually greatly placed on a3, according to the computer. Now he just had to move it back, which um, obviously is a pretty sad sign for him. I'm just going to do rook g8. And my rook is kind of well placed defending everything. Not going to lie, I would love to teleport this rook to g7 if possible. <laughs> but yeah, even though without that... I can tell already it feels like, uh, especially after a loose move like this, Black's initiative is about to triumph. I think he simply forgot that g3 allows queen h4. So we get to <laughs> simply pick up the knight because of the pin. So hey, if you understand uh, just a few simple ideas like uh, trading uh, your bad bishop with this cute maneuver king h8, knight g8, and then bishop h6. Um, you saw my opponent knew the first 13 moves, maybe he like studied the course, he knew everything really precisely, but then when it came down to uh, the main plans, he was really struggling, he had to pretty much redo every move, and turns out we have an easy win now, but uh, it's not always when you have an easy, easy win that uh, <laughs> you're going to win easily. I'm sure you guys uh, can uh, relate. Kind of like e4, queen f4 because there is knight g4. Here's f3 though, kind of saving him, which I'm not a fan of. I have knight h2, rook h2, and then rook g3, but then king h1, and I have nothing. So I just gotta keep it simple and not get flagged, basically. I'm, I'm afraid there might be uh, no checkmate, so. Just gonna go uh, perhaps back. Maybe e4 idea. Yeah, I think that's good. Queen f5. Uh, I'm quite happy with the move. Uh, maybe he's gonna play knight c3 now, trying to stop e4. I think uh, that's what I would do if I was him. Perhaps additionally, we could consider this idea of throwing uh, the pawn to increase the pressure. But uh, yeah, at this point, even if you play a move like queen g4, should be easily winning. I just play queen f5 kind of because I feel like we don't have uh, so much time on the clock and I'm trying to uh, find a quicker finish if possible. Not sure uh, that's manageable for us, but I'm going to do rook g5 now. Should I do rook g5? Kind of like weird move. I'm going to play knight g7 instead. Defending the queen, preparing to simplify, bring the rook. So, knight e4, I think just takes, go in for the trades, fg next, yeah, okay, he takes to the queen, that's reasonable, but uh, I'm just going to take, and I'm going to get my knight out of d4, okay? Bobby Fisher once said that uh, whenever he can get uh, his knight on d4 in the king's Indian as black, he will never lose. Of course, <laughs> he was not referring to an extra knight on d4. He was just saying like a uh, knight on d4 in general. But you can imagine that uh, if it's the extra knight, it is even nicer. And I missed a beautiful tactic. I had rook g3 there, but uh, hey, just uh, in the memory of Bobby Fischer, one of the greatest Kings Indian players of all time, I had to get my knight into d4, despite being a bad move. So here we go, collecting the pawn. One minute left on the clock. Rook b2, I gotta defend first. But... This seems to look uh, winnable. It looks more and more winnable. I can tell you that. Okay, he wants g5, so just gotta sidestep that idea. Uh, notice that uh, I have my own plan, but I'm constantly looking for uh, potential tricks that he wants. So with the move, he wants to go there. Can we defend? Uh, I don't really see a way to defend. Damn it. Uh, maybe Bobby Fischer knight on d4 was not so uh, good at the end of the day. <laughs> okay, I'm just gonna take. Uh, what can I do? So I'm gonna go king g5, checks, and I'm gonna go king g4. Checks me. I'm like running a crazy risk of being perpetual. So I'm gonna go here and try to hide this way. Oh, he has g5 now, good move. I shouldn't have allowed that. 
g5, uh, no, okay, he didn't. Didn't play it, fine. I'm quite okay with the fact that he didn't play it, but... I'm gonna go to f2, 10 seconds left. Man, if we spoil this game, this brilliant win, that would be such a pity. I'm gonna go b5 next. Hopefully we can get a mate in time. 10 seconds left, 92 check. 92 check, b5, hopefully we can win a rook. Can I win a rook? Oh no, I cannot win the rook. Four seconds left. Oh my. This would be tragic if we don't win it. <gasps> I lost my rook. He didn't take. Sadly, I eventually lost that one on time, but we can move on towards the following game where I decided to skip you the pain of myself explaining the opening for two more minutes and I'm just gonna take you to the critical part of the game. When I play G3, well, always we're gonna play D6. So King's Indian, always get the Fianchero, always plays D6. Now, the next part uh, gets a little tricky. So. What you need to understand in general is that, uh, well, what is our main pawn break? Because uh, I've seen uh, different people playing uh, Kings Indian in different ways. One of the nice things about it is that you are so uh, flexible that you have a choice between many setups. But in general, okay, just to get started, it is very important to understand that uh, normally the main way to break in the Kings Indian is with e5, okay? Sure, there are uh, options to play with c5, but that is more of like the Benoni move. Idea to, let's say, let him push and think of it as you get this bishop active. Well, the point is uh, you play e5 and maybe even expand in the center. A lot of the times the idea with e5 is that uh, then, let's say, you move the knight away, you play f5, and you build a massive uh, pawn center. And you create uh, all these kind of triangle of pawns and you're basically trying to checkmate the enemy king. A little bit trickier to do that against uh, Fianchero, but uh, yeah, usually we start knight c6. Idea with knight c6 is to play e5. Okay, we cannot do e5 immediately because it's losing a pawn. And uh, alternatively, knight d7 with similar idea is another big main line. But knight c6 I think is the easiest. And no need to be afraid uh, of d5 because you have a bit of a weird move that actually works uh, very well. Because on d5, knight a5 is quite strong. Yes voluntarily placing the knight on the edge of the board. I know, kind of uh, sketchy, but queen a4 is not a problem because simply c5 and uh, you're defending your knight, you can never trap your knight and then you have sort of a easy plan to play a6, rook b8, uh, bishop d7, kick the queen and then b5. Typical play for the variation, but he castles, allowing e5. So this is pretty much the main position. Uh, already hundreds, if not thousands of games have been seen with this at Grandmaster level. Why well, there's a big choice between mainly taking or playing uh, d5. On d5, I recommend uh, knight b8 with a simple plan to play uh, a5, knight a6, get a knight onto c5, and then uh, move this knight from f6 either to e8 or d7 and play f5. And idea to, yet again, attack white on the king's side. So uh, that's that on d5. On takes, I recommend you take back with the pawn, queen d8, rook d8, and uh, this is leading to kind of like a typical endgame for the variation. If you're just getting started, uh, I wouldn't really bother too much uh, about that. So he plays e3. Now e3 is uh, an interesting move. Um, it is definitely something that uh, it's not a mistake. It's just not very critical, but it's not a mistake. I could do e4, but after knight to d2, notice that my pawn is kind of lonely. So I'm going to start, I believe, with the move rook to e8. Additionally, you could consider e d4 and then bishop g4. Simply trying to kind of uh, attack the center and put pressure on the center. Rook e8, uh, on the other hand, is kind of like a useful uh, universal move. and still kind of keeping his bishop locked in by the pawn. 
Whenever he plays with e3, usually it's a sign that he tries to go for the double fianchiero, but we'll see. I wouldn't be surprised if at this point opponent changes his mind and plays d5. But no, here we have rook e1. So, uh, yeah, now I have a choice between uh, bishop g4, where after h3, I'm not super sure how to continue. No, h3 actually takes, I think it's good. Because if queen takes... ED4 seems to be winning a pawn. He cannot recapture because the rook remains hanging. And as well as uh, bishop g4, h3 takes, takes, bishop takes, ED4 seems to be annoying for the same reason. After takes, we take the rook and then the pawn remains undefended. Now, the issue with bishop g4 is that he could go d5. But, uh, yeah, then we just move the knight and I guess we're getting a typical game. Additionally, takes uh, rook e1. I think it's uh, enough for equality, but uh, let's get started with bishop g5. In case of d5, I didn't mention this, but I think knight e5 as well as d5 look uh, comfortable, and he indeed plays uh, the most natural move in the position. However, as I explained, I think this is simply a mistake after bishop takes on f3. Uh, just kind of uh, taking advantage of the fact that the queen is overloaded. Notice how the queen is defending both uh, the rook and the pawn. So important here to take on e1 with check first, deflecting the queen and then pick up the pawn. Do not mess up the move order because after knight d4 he has intermediate move. And after you take he has queen d4. And uh, I think you're just losing. So gotta take. And then I'm gonna take on d4. Creating a multitude of very unpleasant threats. Now, do you think you can uh, just go ahead and grab the pawn on b7 thinking, okay, I lost the pawn, at least uh, I'll take a pawn? Well, pause the video because that would be a huge mistake. Just huge blunder. And he immediately plays it. Well, maybe natural move is okay, but the point was that, uh, well, we can go in uh, pretty deep. We can go in pretty deep for the knight. Going for the counter-attack. Knocking at the uh, opponent's uh, door with a fork. And, uh, well, I take the rook. He takes rook, but I also get to take bishop. So, me has extra bishop. Me has good position with that. Now, the biggest question of the, of the game, whether we can win it or not, is... Can we actually rescue the a1 knight? Because he seems to be hunting it immediately if he had an extra tempo playing knight e4 i mean playing bishop to b2 uh collecting the knight he would be fine however uh i kind of spoiled my move uh with that i think i have knight e4 and this is a critical move notice that if he could somehow teleport the queen to f3 with a pin that would be annoying that's not a thing so he is forced to take. I'm going to take back with a queen. And then notice how the bishop from g7 is defending uh, my knight all the way to a1. Well, that's a pretty long range piece. So long range uh, to the point where uh, opponent uh, completely forgot about it. And I can just go in and uh, take the knight. I can also take it this way, but I'm just going to take with a tempo. And notice how uh, every single one of my pieces is defending each other just like uh, a perfect uh, machine. Perfect well-oiled uh, machine. And queen c2 attacking the knight. Now, the knight is already defended. So, shall we just keep attacking his king with a move such as bishop to d4? Putting pressure on f2. Well, that's interesting. But you should uh, open up your eyes, you bozo. Because his queen is hanging. Dude, that's just a free queen. Just take the queen. <laughs> All right? Okay. We don't have to talk about it. I'm sure you spotted the free queen in time. Anyways, um, yeah. That's kind of like um, how things could go wrong for white if they're not careful to defend uh, their center. This time we had a bit of an uh, open center kind of uh, situation game. A lot of times, uh, King's Indian is leading to closed positions, but uh, it's important to understand why, in general, White is the one to close down the center, just to avoid such disaster from happening, you know? Uh, because if uh, all of Black pieces start to cooperate together, I'm pretty sure that uh, White can get in deep trouble. 
So uh, yeah, I guess the opponent just uh, rage quit and we're gonna wait uh, to time him down and just uh, collect our free win. As expected, my opponent never came back to make a move. Therefore, we can move on towards the last model game of this video, which is how to play against the English opening. Do not confuse English opening with a Fianchiero setup because there's quite a significant difference uh, when it comes on how White is placing his pawns in the center. So I don't want to spoil it, so I'll let you see what I mean. All right, everybody, opponent uh, opens up uh, with c4, the English opening. So everything that's not one e4, where you could play the Karakhan, we're going to be going for the King's Indian in this video. And already he combines uh, c4 with the Fianchiaro. So, okay, I'm just going to be King's Indianing. I cannot really do much about that. I'm going to castle, I'm going to play d6, and we're going to take it from there. These uh, first moves are uh, rather simple. Now d6 creates a threat of e5, so white has the option of stopping that by playing d4, where, um, yeah, we already had a game like this. Knight to c6 followed by e5 is my main recommendation. However, he just uh, castles, meaning that uh, it is allowing us to play e5. So I'm going to do it. Usually after e5, uh, this kind of opponents just play d3. However, he still has option to play d4. And we're going to go knight c6 transposing. But most of them are just going to play with d3. Kind of like an English opening setup. Uh, and all right. Wow. This is uh, a typical starting position uh, precisely against uh, English opening kind of players. And you have many ways of uh, approaching it. Okay. I think uh, the most solid one is to play something like c6, rook e8, followed by uh, d5. However, just to kind of show you most of the typical main ideas, I'm going to try to play for a kingside attack. So I think we start with the move knight to c6 here. Just kind of uh, making him play rook b1, pushing b4. That is uh, White's uh, main idea, like the way he has uh, the pawn structure kind of lined up. The plan is to expand on the queen side with b4, b5, trying to lengthen the uh, diagonal for uh, the Fianchiarot bishop. However, he starts with bishop g5, which is not a mistake, but after h6, I kind of like my position. They will normally just take, and uh, we pretty much just get the bishop pair uh, for free, so... Yeah, gonna take uh, this way, no need to get the queen uh, developed. I'm gonna next move, no matter what he does, slide back the bishop. Now this is a bit of an annoying threat, so it's... Even though the bishop is kind of like uh, staring into the pawn, if you want, it is still a very strong bishop, so I'm gonna keep it. Just because it has potential to open up with e4 in the future. And, alright! On the bright side, the opponent does have uh, a strong knight on d5. However, it's not the kind of knight that uh, you can never really get rid of. Uh, so, if I really want to, I could play knight e7. And the exchange is uh, only well-placed piece. I kind of like that idea. Queen b3, though, is a sign of a very bad move. Like, pretty much opponent knew the first, like, seven moves, and then he was clueless. He pretty much forgot to learn what is like the biggest idea for the English opening in this structure against King's Indian. He was supposed to go for a queenside pawn play. And queen b3 is an anti-positional uh, move because it's really just stopping his main plan, which was to push the pawns. So, yeah, I think we can really just uh, play something like uh, knight to e7. I can't develop the bishop because the pawn will remain hanging and uh, I don't want to allow any weird things, so... Additionally, knight d4, not the move that I would really play because it allows double pawns, but it brings up a funny idea because it's kind of uh, restricting the knight. Like having a pawn on d4 takes away d squares and maybe c6 could, uh, in some lines, trap the knight. It's a bit of a funny move, but uh, yeah, I think it's really risky strategically and uh, super uncalled for. So simple chess here, just exchanging his most active piece. He immediately uh, is happy with the trade. If I was him, I would wait, because if black takes, white is happy to uh, open up the file 
just look at this idea. If he is able to get the pawn to d5, at least he could try to double up rooks and put pressure on the backward pawn on c7. Uh, I wouldn't have taken though. Uh, next move, if he was not taking, I would have played c6 and either uh, force him trade or force him go back. I wouldn't have allowed uh, that position. So rook d1, this indicates that uh, he is willing to break with d4. Now we can either uh, try to stop him from uh, pushing d4 or we can try to come up uh, with a good answer when d4 is getting played. So not a huge fan of uh, a move such as c5. It's just kind of creating a weird pawn on d6. So I don't want to, mm, let's see, um, make my pawn structure this stubborn. I still kind of want to keep my pawns somewhat flexible. On d4 though, that's not a huge problem. We have at the very least uh, just takes and uh, perhaps even win a pawn after uh, queen e2. I could also play a uh, simple move, f5, d4, go e4 after. However, I'm going to do something prophylactic. Okay, you see, I want to play f5. But because the queen is a little bit annoying, it's not like it's anything devastating. After c5 check, I can still block with a bishop. But I just want to get, uh, you know, myself uh, out of that diagonal, expecting him to play d4. Never mind, he goes back. And now we are going to be going for uh, the typical king's Indian play. So you really want to remember this. We're going to go uh, f5, f4, g5, and then just try to get some kind of an attack. In case of d4, though, our plan may uh, change a little. Because, uh, yeah, on d4, that just invites us to play e4. Okay, he plays b3. Just kind of like a prophylactic move, I guess, not to have the pawn hanging there uh, in any variations. Now, quite a nice move could be c6. Just sort of making sure the bishop is staring into this block of granite forever. Just gonna be passive, but I don't think we need it just yet. And I could play f4. With the idea that on d4, already e4 is much stronger. So I quite like f4. Ready to, to play uh, g5 and d4, I have at least bishop f5, very strong move. And pawn takes, it's quite uh, dubious, allowing open file and uh, opening g file onto his king. I don't think he should ever take. I think he should start uh, perhaps maneuvering the knight, try to get like knight e2, knight e4. My move is a little bit uh, risky, strategically speaking, but I do really believe that uh, we have some very dangerous attacking prospects. So this is kind of like first position. Okay, getting our pawn pyramid on the king side. And on d4, remember, bishop to f5. That's how we block the check. Here again, if he takes, we're quite happy. And if he does not take, well, I have a monster threat of playing g4. Knight moves away, and then I play f3. And the bishop is going to be trapped uh, on h1 for like the rest of the game. It's pretty much like we're playing with an extra piece. White is dead lost, okay? Uh, I'm going to show a little bit of that uh, after the game, how you can easily win such positions by uh, transitioning the game onto the other side of the board. For now, he takes, though, and I can take it this way, opening up Bishop's path. However, he may be willing to do like rookie one attacking the queen. But you know what? If you go GF, I think you're lacking uh, quite an important idea. Because after pawn takes, we still have a monster threat of playing g4, f3. So if you take this way, there is no more threat of g4. So the idea of g4 combined with the fact that we open up the bishop, I think I should make this the best way to recapture. Rook e1 just simply queen f7. d4 never a problem because of bishop f5. Yet again, the same theme. And... I just can't wait to play g4, f3. And if he wants to take, simply take it with a rook, yeah? As I told you. I can even play, uh, you know, like consider g4, but no need to uh, help him maneuver the knight. So I'm going to take this way and notice that the f-file is very soft. I could go queen f7, bishop g4, pin, pile up more pressure on the knight. The rook is going to come here. And uh, all of my pieces are kind of uh, nicely working together for the same objective, which is uh, absolutely demolishing the enemy king. So rook e1, simply attacking the queen. I'm going to play queen f7. 
keeping bishop open and keeping f8 square uh, open for the rook. And next up, potentially bishop g4 is devastating because it's going to be unable to unpin. So that is just going to be unstoppable. And uh, yeah, the bishop is going to come there kind of uninvited. <laughs> so what should the opponent really play to kind of survive? I guess rook d2. Rook d2 maybe, idea to answer bishop g4 with, I don't know what really, but he finally tries the check. Problem is that the check uh, does not solve all of my opponent's issues. I'm going to bring the bishop and then I can still do the same. He's pretty much losing material. Hello opponent. But you know what? I'm going to bring the last piece into the game first. Should I? If I do this, he wants rook e3, I guess. Then maybe not very easy. If I do this, he wants check. I can go uh, king g8 and he plays the same rook e3. But then I just uh, bring the rook and... Honestly, that's game. Yeah, that's not negotiable. I think we should just uh, pull the trigger here. That's kind of like a funny trivia uh, in my... Uh, let's say, last uh, sort of serious tournament. Uh, I was playing with the black pieces uh, in the last round in the Graz Open in Austria. And I was in a must win situation with black facing a grandmaster. And I had to go for it to secure the international master title. And I played the King's Indian. He played a Fianchero against it, just like our opponent. And I still managed to win it somehow. So there are some miracles. You could win against Fianchero. <laughs> um, as we can see it here. I was, of course, very disgusted when my opponent played Fianchero just because it's such a solid line. And uh, okay, I mean, maybe sure you can, I guess, equalize against that. But playing it for a win is not easy. And the opponent really finds himself in such a desperate situation that just plays knight 2 saying, okay, you can have my rook if you really want it. Now, I'm the kind of guy that would go for more, but also, you gotta be aware that uh, bishop to d5 could be a tricky attempt. So I'm gonna take, I think, and then the point is, he still bishop d5, I take his queen, that doesn't work. And when he recaptures, I'm just going to try to shut down this bishop, shut down any tricky ideas by what? You post the video and uh, tell me the move that uh, we should really go for. Because you don't want to be playing, okay, goofy, greedy, rook f2, bishop d4, thinking, oh, I'm playing king's Indian, I'm just doing uh, what Alex Banzia told me to do so. Then you allow bishop d5. And then you're not going to like the king's Indian so much. And for this reason, uh, you just want to remember this key idea. Bishop on g2 is shut down by a pawn on c6. That is precisely defended by another pawn. Making this bishop completely useless. Just look at this. Uh, very nice pawns. Untouchable, simply. Gonna take. He's probably going to go into the corner. I'm literally going to be going after him. I'm just hunting down my opponent at this point. Rook takes on h2. He's being threatened. I just feel like the end is very near. And uh, 94 luckily defends against that because uh, check, knight g3, queen h4, bishop h3, prolongs the fight. But I'm going to be playing uh, queen to f4 perhaps, threatening to mate. He has to go h3. But then we have the opportunity of playing bishop e5 turning. I'm trying to pretty much uh, aim precisely at his king here. Not very easy to do so. He's also threatening queen takes on d4. So we got to act and we got to act quick. I'm going to do queen f4, expecting h3. Then simply playing uh, bishop e5, expecting king g1, infiltrating. King will go on to f2. Or none of that happens because he blunders immediately. <laughs> so even uh, nicer when this happens. Threatening this, he's going to play h3. 
I'm going to sacrifice the rook. Then I'm going to be taking with the queen. Setting up a deadly mating net. Just because the bishop is um, taking away the main uh, escaping square of the enemy king. So, all right. That uh, seems to be it for the game. Only 30 seconds left. No increment. But it just looks uh, to be a checkmate on the board. So if you guys didn't know, checkmate end the game. Right. Bishop h3? No. Just fails for that immediately. Rook takes. Only move to take. Gonna take. Gotta be a checkmate. Uh, so. Alright. Not too shabby. Before I let you go, quick disclaimer. Everything that you have just seen in this video can be played against any opening other than 1e4. So, you need something additional specifically for this move. So, in order to get you covered there, please feel free to check out the video that will appear on the screen. In only 20 minutes, I'm pretty much sharing my experience of being a Karokan player for more than eight years. And honestly, it's one of the videos I spent the most work on since it took more than 20 hours to record. So, I'll see you there.